Welcome to another sermon from All People Christian Church. It is our hope that this message will encourage, inspire, and challenge you in your walk with God. That said, let me jump into today's sermon. And um, you're going to love this, Christina, because Christina once told me, because she's so bright and we have so many young, intelligent people and even not so young, intelligent people, right? Like myself and others. My mom is the wisest person I know. And um, I can tell you this, that uh, those uh, who love God and love truth are hungry. They're hungry for knowledge, not just knowledge that puffs you up and makes you proud, as the Bible says, but knowledge that transforms you and makes you what's more important than smart, that's wise. And uh, so uh, Christina was saying to me one time how she loves when uh, her pastor will quote out of the Greek and the Hebrew and things. You remember that? And so I got a lot of Greek for you today. So you're going to love this because it works with uh, the message I have. But I want to talk to you today about the sanctification process. Will you say that big fancy word with me? The sanctification process. Now, I know that's a word you use all day, every day. And uh, joke, joke, right? But this is the key to living in victory, not just going through the process, because if you have given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you have been spiritually regenerated, or as the Bible calls it, born again, or saved is another term we use, uh, then you are already in the sanctification process, whether you realize it or not, or whether you are actively participating with God in it or not. But I want to bring awareness to you today about what this process is, how it works, why we have things like Victory Day coming up, or why we study the Bible every day and so on, so that you can have a greater appreciation for what God is trying to do in your life. Whether you're like me and you have a certain limited amount of days left and you don't know how many, or you're young and you're just at the front end of everything and looking ahead, you are in, if you're in Christ, you're in the sanctification process. So in order for you to understand that well, I'm going to have to, to break it down a little bit for you. I'm even going to, and I'll apologize on the front end, I'm going to have to give you a bit of a, a grammar lesson today, an English grammar, Greek grammar lesson today. So don't let me lose you in that. I'm not an expert in language. I usually have one of my daughters who's a terrific writer here. The other is a math whiz and genius. And I always have my writing daughter uh, edit all my stuff for me so that I say it properly. But uh, I'm going to do my best here today. Let's start, oops, let's start with our first verse here. This is the main passage that we're going to draw from today. It's out of 1 Thessalonians when Paul was writing to the church in Thessalonica and he was giving them these exhortations. And as he's wrapping up the letter, he gets to the end here in chapter five and he says, now, say now. Okay, so that's kind of where in a conversation you'll say, okay, so now with all that said, let me begin to conclude with this. That's sort of where we jump in. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify, say sanctify. Okay, so there's that word, but in, it, in a different version, right? We're going to see it used several ways. May he now himself sanctify you completely. That is what I want you to catch there. He says, and may your whole, say whole, okay? Yeah, I'm just emphasizing these things. Your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, speaking of God. He will surely do it. Now, why is Paul saying, may your whole spirit and soul and body, why doesn't he just say you? Well, it's because we are made in the image of God. And if you didn't know, but you definitely know from having done our Purple Book group this summer and learning the foundations of the faith or having done our Going Deeper group this summer where we went much deeper into the foundational doctrines of our faith, you know that God, our God, is a triune being. He is not just God, our Father. He is not just the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
He is not just the Holy Spirit. He is all three. Amen? Now, I know the Trinity is a mystery that is beyond our human limited comprehension to fully grasp, and we have some great analogies we use to help us understand that better. But God is God, and he doesn't have to be someone who can fit inside our pea-sized brains in order to be who he is. But it says in the Bible that we are made in the image of God. Well, just like God, we too are triune beings. Every one of us has a physical body, which will, because of the corruption of this life and sin, be in the grave and will eventually just turn to dust. From dust we came to dust we will return. And the thing I look forward to is we will get a new and glorified eternal body that doesn't get cancer, doesn't get sick in the end. Now, I don't want to go into that. That's a whole separate teaching. But then we have a spirit. That is why in every single civilization that's ever existed in the history of the world, when they find a new civilization that's never had contact with the outside world, they always find this one thing that civilization had some kind of a religious, spiritual belief system. How does that happen? No one taught them that. It's because inside of all of us is a spiritual yearning. Now, the Bible says, apart from Christ, that we're spiritually dead, that we're spiritually separated from God, so it's like the receiver is down. And when we're born again, we're born again not physically, but spiritually And when we are, we come alive spiritually, and our spirit and God's spirit are united as one. He comes to live inside of us, and it's like the reception is back up. But then there's this tricky part, and this is going to answer some of the questions that I hope um, you feel like you have a better answer to today. Questions like, okay, why is it as a Christian I still struggle with sin? Or some Christians I know still struggle with even major sin. Or can you lose your salvation if you sin badly enough? You know, or or, or questions like, um, are we just, as as, uh, uh, Jill was saying earlier, are we just a bunch of sinners saved by grace? So we can't, you know, possibly um, be expected to live righteously because, you know, we were sinners, we needed a Savior, and that's it. And the answer to that is no. The answer is no, you can't just lose your salvation by falling into sin because you didn't earn your salvation through good performance. You can't lose it through poor performance. But you can mar and you can interfere with your relationship with God. And why do you struggle with sin as a believer? Well, we're going to get into that primarily today and not just why you do, but what you can do about it and how you can live in greater victory. Amen? So how many here would like to live in greater victory over sin and temptation in your life? Okay, good. You should all raise your hand because even if you're thinking, well, I don't struggle with looking at porn or I'm not, you know, at down uh, gambling all of my paycheck away at the casinos or, you know, cursing, drinking, smoking, or hanging out with people who do or whatever kind of thing, you know, that you may think of as sin. Well, if you gossip, if you are anxious and stressed, full of fear, full of anxiety. Those are all symptoms of sin in our life. So any reasonable sane person should want to have as much victory over sin as they can have. Amen? So let me finish this introduction by just giving you a couple other thoughts to consider. And this is where you're going to get a little bit of a grammar lesson. So instead of uh, trying to recite it, I wrote it on the slides you're about to see in hopes that it'll help you follow. But as I mentioned a moment ago, God's will is not just to save us so we can go to heaven. Because if that was the end-all, be-all, then none of us would still be here if you've been saved. He would have just saved you and said, good, I rescued you out from the clutches of the enemy. Let's go to heaven and get out of here. But instead, he leaves you, not in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty now and now, right? And he's got a reason for doing that. And he wants to, while you're alive on this earth, whether for another day or another hundred years, he wants to do a thorough, say thorough. Thorough means uh, all-encompassing, okay? Ongoing, say ongoing. Yeah, that means it never stops work in our lives. Here's how I would describe it. So let's start with a definition of sanctification as we're 
again, introducing this whole concept. The Greek word for sanctification is this word called hagiosmos, okay? It's a noun translated as sanctification, holiness, or separation. So you would say, like, I have experienced hagiosmos, okay? I've been sanctified, set apart by God, right? But the term is always used in relation to believers and is from the root word hagios, which is actually an adjective for holy. So you would say, I am hagios, okay? Like I've been sanctified by God, right? Now hang in there with me. Don't let me lose you, okay? And is sometimes, here's the key, used as a verb hagiazo, which means to cleanse or make holy. Now that's the part I need you to catch because the verb is de a description of what God didn't just do past or isn't going to do in the future, but what he's doing in the present. This goes on to explain it. In the Bible, sanctification, this is the last slide about this, is used alongside salvation. Because you, you may not have noticed this, but the concept of salvation, how many of you have heard of salvation? Okay, yeah, I hope so. That's used in the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense. And you're saying, well, well how can that be? It can't be all three at the same time. Yes, it can. Because it's all part of the all-encompassing, ongoing work God's doing in your life. It's often referred to as a lifelong progressive growth in holiness. This is what your life is supposed to look like as a Christian. Like salvation, it can be separated into three, say three, three phases. Justification, which is what happened when you got saved. You were legally justified in the sight of God. If you died in that moment, you would go to the same heaven as Mother Teresa or Billy Graham, okay? Then there's maturity. That is this whole in-between process that's happening while you're alive. Then there's the end, hallelujah, glorification. And that's the part we get to look forward to. Justification is a once-for-all positional holiness in Christ, while maturity is a practical progressive, say progressive, yeah, that means it's happening constantly, holiness. Glorification is a permanent, ultimate holiness. When you get to heaven and there is no more sin in your life or around you, these three phases, I love this. I stole this part, quote for word for word, right off the internet. These three phases separate believers from the penalty of sin. So the penalty was eternal separation from God. That's done, okay? The power of sin, which is what we are learning to overcome in our lives. And then finally, the end, the presence of sin. You want to know why heaven is so awesome? Because there's no sin there. You want to know why earth can be so awful? Because it's full of sin. And that's the big difference. You want to know what hell is like? It's the absence of light and righteousness. So just think of the worst place on planet earth you've ever been and then take what little bit of good might have existed there out. Now you have hell. That's hell. So our salvation through Christ, in other words, is an all-encompassing deliverance. It's a deliverance from the penalty of sin. It's a deliverance from the power of sin, which we're in dealing with right now. And it's a deliverance from the ultimate consequences and even having to deal with for all of eternity sin. Oh, man. That's why I'm going to give you one more little breakdown here about the word salvation. May I have permission to define salvation for you? It's kind of an important word in the Bible that I think you need to really have a solid grasp of, okay? Now, the Greek word for salvation is soteria, which can be translated, check this out, as deliverance, preservation or salvation as we use it. Soteria has many meanings, check this out, including physical deliverance, bodily health, and the safety of the soul. God cares about all of it. He cares about every part of your life. It also has a related verb, sozo. Some of you might have known there was a, a, a very popular inner healing and deliverance ministry that came out of a church in Northern California called sozo. That's where they got it from. It means to save or to heal. Sozo can refer to, refer to being saved, healed, or delivered. And, say and, can also have spiritual meanings such as being delivered 
from the devil who is real and his demons. So if you didn't know this, you have a spiritual enemy who never takes a break, never takes vacation, and hates you with the most intense hatred you can hate anybody with. And you're thinking, what did I do? Well, you are loved by God, and anything or anyone loved by God is that much hated by him. So God's perfect love equals his perfect hatred for you because that's a level of hate he has for God. So if you're not aware of the devil and his work in your life, then he's thrilled because he's winning. Amen? So let's go back and break this down into three parts, and then I'll bring this plane to the runway and we'll land it. But I want you to understand, I'm hoping now with all this, you know, Greek and other grammatical instruction that you are now fully informed on what we're talking about here, that there's a past, there's a present tense, and there is a future to this process. So the sanctification process includes several things. Number one, what God has done. Can you say has done? Okay. So we're talking about, as I said before, what God's done. And that's why the more you understand this, the less you struggle as you mature in your faith with things like, well, gosh, I, I kind of backslid for a season or I, I fell into sin over here or I thought I had beaten this vice or this sin in my life and then, well, man, I fell back in it. I feel like I need to get re-water baptized. I need to get re-saved at church. I need to all this. And that, I get it. Your conscience is on fire. You're convicted of your sin, but now it's gone from conviction to what the devil uses, a word called condemnation. See, conviction simply says like, hey, what you said yesterday when you spoke harshly to that person, that was wrong. You need to apologize for that. And you're like, ouch, yeah, I'm convicted. Condemnation says, and by the way, you're a piece of junk, and you do that all the time. And by the way, I don't care if you apologize or not, you'll never be forgiven of that. You're just in just beating, beating, beating. You ever had a relationship like that or a fight with someone like that and they couldn't let it go and they just kept bringing it up and beating you over the head with it? Yeah, that's called condemnation. Yeah, our enemy is great at it. So let's look at the past here. I'm going to bring up a few scriptures that will help us understand this. When Paul was writing to the church in Corinth in chapter 6, verse 11, he used something that I would say in grammatical terms is called just the simple past tense. You know, it's like this happened. He said, now keep in mind, he's writing to the Corinthians. These guys were Paul's hot mess, okay? This church in Corinth, Corinth was the Las Vegas of the world at that time, okay? It was a port city full of a wide mixture of ethnic groups that had come from all over the place, it was full of debauchery and sin and prostitution and every kind of problem you could have at that time. So when all those people got sanctified, past tense, saved, they still brought their baggage into the kingdom. Do you ever notice that when you get saved, if you have problems in your life, those problems still go into the kingdom with you, you know, in terms of their things that you still have to slowly unpack. We call it baggage, and you got to start letting them go, right? So these Corinthians were a hot mess. So he gets to the end of chapter 6, or he's getting into it, and he goes, look, stop just suing each other, gossiping about each other, tearing each other apart, sleeping with each other's wives. He's like, oh, my gosh, you're saved, but you're a hot mess. He goes, some of you were like that, but you forget you were washed. You were sanctified. See that word? That's the past tense. You were justified. That's talking about salvation. See how they go hand in hand? He said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. In other words, he's saying in simple past tense, you're not that person anymore. But as, as uh, David was saying when he prophesied earlier about the power of the tongue, he was saying he could walk into an NBA arena during his career and be intimidated and think, oh, man, this NBA arena is bad. This is a bad place. It got bad, hard rims. Everything bounces off. These people hate me or whatever. Or he could choose to look at it differently. And you can either just be like, well, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'll just live any old way I want. And I'm like, wow, man, what kind of gratitude is that? 
You know, or you could say, no, I am not that person anymore, and I'm not going to live that way anymore. I used to gossip like crazy, you may say to yourself, and like, I was addicted to that stuff, or porn ruled my life. I've talked to so many people, so many men even, and women nowadays in the world we live in, and there's things that have just absolutely controlled their lives, and they desperately want to be free, but they don't believe they can be. But in Christ, you can. There is nothing, nothing you can't be delivered of in and through Christ. That's why he said, some of you were like that, but you were washed. You were hagiazo. You were set apart and sanctified, justified. Amen? Now, here is another verse to help emphasize this first point that I absolutely love. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 is almost like John 3.16 to me. The reason John 3.16, for God so loved the world, right? Can some of you quote it with me? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, it's almost a requirement as a Christian. You got to memorize John 3.16, right? You'll see it everywhere. Why is that so popular? Because it practically gives the entire gospel story in one verse, right? Well, this, in one verse, out of the amazing letter of Hebrews, we don't even know for sure who wrote it, is, summarizes almost the entire sanctification process. It says, for by one offering, one, he, speaking of Jesus, has perfected. Check that out, perfected. Wait, you said I'm not perfect yet. Yeah, but God speaking it, over you and about you as if it's done already because God is not limited by this linear time we live in. He said he has perfected for all time. Say all time. Yeah, that means forever. It's done. Those, which is you, who are what? Being sanctified. Oh my gosh. Think about that for a second. What is that saying? That is saying that while you're still a hot mess in this life, and you give God all kinds of fits as your dad, okay? As his spoiled child who messes up and drops the ball and makes promises and then breaks them and does all, come on, right? Am I only talking about myself here? Or you guys are so righteous and holy, you know, that none of this applies to you. I get it. Okay, so just judge me then, okay? Because I do all those things. And yet God is like, yeah, But as far as I'm concerned, it's a done deal. We're going to work on this as we go, but it's going to be finished because I already perfected you. In other words, if I died today and I stood before God at the, at the throne of, of God himself and had to give an answer for why should I even be allowed into heaven, I would say I have nothing to offer except everything, which is the, the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, that has perfected me in your sight forever even while I'm still a hot mess in this life. Wow. That's why that is something very important called the present progressive tense of a verb. You're being sanctified. In other words, for all time, you have been perfected by one single offering. When Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, you are being hagiazo. You are being hagiazo. So God is working with what he's done, what he is doing, and what's going to be done. Amen? So that's why it's not just what God has done. It's what God, what? Is doing. Now we talk about today. Now we talk about, what is it, August 18th? Is that right? 2024. We're talking here about August 18th, 2024, What is God doing in your life today? Well, he is the one, thankfully, driving and initiating this process. So before you get too holy and righteous and self-righteous, excuse me, get holy and righteous, just not self-righteous, okay? You got to remember that you wouldn't even be saved. You wouldn't even know Jesus. You wouldn't be sitting in church today if God himself had not initiated the process with you. Now, I'm not getting into the whole Calvinism versus Arminianism argument and things that can't be settled in this lifetime. I'm just talking about the fact that there's no denying that God is the one who draws you to repentance by his loving kindness. The fact that Jesus died for the whole world is proof that God cares about how many people? 
There you go, Janessa. My daughter started that years ago. It's still, yep, you started it, babe. I don't know. You said it on a recording, and that's when it became famous. So now it's here to stay, and we'll never get rid of it. Uh, so God is the one driving and initiating the process. What do I mean by that? Look at Philippians chapter 2. Paul, once again, the great theologian, maybe the greatest second to Jesus of all time, if you want to say, is writing to the church in Philippi, and he goes, I love you guys because the Philippians were a great church. They weren't like the Corinthians. They were better behaved, and they always supported him financially. So he said, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, because he's writing from prison, he said, work out, what? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But wait, I thought we were not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. So why is he talking about working out your salvation? That seems confusing. Ah, look deeper. Because he said, for it is God who? Who works in you both to will. That means you don't even want to grow as a Christian without God's help. And to work for his good pleasure. Wow. That is awesome. I'm like, thank you, God. I mean, I've been walking now with Jesus for 35 years, full time. You know, I was more living a nominal life before that, and then I surrendered everything to him and chose to follow him and give up everything else in comparison. And I've had some really awful days since then. Some days where I just thought, you know, what am I giving this all up for? Look at everything I left behind. But never have I been truly tempted, I think, where I took it seriously enough to even wake up the next day considering it. Have I ever thought of just walking away? Because God is too good. But even that, you may say, gosh, you're a strong believer. No, I'm not. That is God working in me to will and to want to keep working. Amen? Amen. That's why it says this. Yet we, believe it or not, so you're like, well, which one is it? Is it God who we just take a passive role, put the car in neutral, and let God just drag us? No. You put the car in neutral, you're going to roll down the hill backwards. And as a Christian, you're always moving up a, a, an incline. So you better have your gas, your foot on that gas, or else you put that thing in neutral, you're going to go this way. You're never just sitting still with God. You're either growing in God or you're going backwards. There is no, you know, a friend of mine, Rice Brooks, uh, Dr. Rice Brooks now, brilliant guy, wrote a lot of the books we have back there. He called it sin, sitting in neutral, sin. And I'm like, man, that's a good way to describe it. You want to sit in neutral, you're going to roll backwards. You need to be actively growing in your walk with God. So you're like, well, which one is it, Pastor? Make up your mind. Is it God who's doing the, the work or is it me? And I'd say both and, both and. Because you are an active, not a passive. Now, you can't do God's part of the job, but you can do the part that he enables you to do with the free will he gave you. And that is participate with him. Amen? Amen. We are active. Say active. active. Yeah. Not passive participants. Look at what it says in Ephesians 4. He goes in here and he's writing to the church in Ephesus. So a lot of Paul's great teaching here. Because Paul was the, the master theologian breaking down the Christian life for us. And he's in the, a chapter 4 of Ephesians, and he finally says, look, guys, you've been taught in Christ, okay, to put off. That is an active verb. You consciously put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. So there is a part of you, if you want to answer the question, how can a Christian still struggle with sin? Because you live in this body and in this world. So you have something that Paul fought against and taught about called the flesh. The flesh is not just your physical body as if you should start cutting yourself or hurting yourself. It's, it, it's symbolic of that old you that's still alive. So there's a part of you that's still hanging around in this life that you need to say, hey, dude, you're dead. You're dead. So stop. Just just keep it shut. Stop. Nope. Don't need to hear from you anymore. The new me is driving the boat now. It's kind of like how the devil lost all authority. 
But most Christians don't know that. See, he had a certain measure of authority through the first Adam who failed. When the second Adam, Jesus, came, he perfectly obeyed God, rose from the dead, defeated sin and the power of death, comes to his disciples and says, all, say all, all, all authority now has been given to me in heaven and where? On earth. So wherever the devil is still running things, he is an illegitimate squatter who needs to be cast out through prayer and love and evangelism. That's what's going on. And if any part of the old you is still running things and running your life, it's because you forgot who you are in Christ and you need to put that old self aside and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. That's why you've got to read the Bible because it reminds you every day who you are and put on. So you take something off and you put something on. That's active. It didn't say God will do that for you. It's saying you do it. The new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, if you're a triune being, that means that you now have one part of you that is 100% perfect. Your spirit, when it is born again, is not corrupted. Peter the apostle said, born of incorruptible seed. You have a part of you now that if you let it run your life, always wants to obey God. That's power, amen? Because before you sinned, because it's what you were, you were a sinner. That's like saying, I, you know, I bark because I'm a dog, <laughs> you know? I sin because I'm a sinner. So that's what leads finally to the last part. What God, not just what God has done, not just what God is doing, but what God will do. Amen? I'm going to give you a little sneak preview to the end of the movie, and it's pretty awesome. How many like a happy ending to a story or a movie? Most of us do, right? That's why, you know, only certain artistic forms and cultures and whatever will end stories with a sad ending, but usually we want a happy ending, right? What's he going to do? He's going to finish what he starts. I'm so grateful. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, how many of you have ever started something that you didn't finish. <laughs> okay, all of us, right? God has a perfect track record. There's no unfinished projects around his house. He doesn't have any half remodeled bathrooms or anything like that. He always finishes what he starts. And there's no half finished believers. Philippians 1 6 is one of the greatest promises in the Bible. Paul was writing to his favorite church in Philippi and he said, Look, I am sure of this. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, if you've ever had, if you're a parent like me, you've ever had a child who fell away from God, or if you've ever had a friend who fell away from God, or a family member, or somebody close to you who has really maybe fallen uh, uh, in a backwards way or something, trust me, you're going to start quoting Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. You are going to hang on to that promise for dear life. You're going to hang on to it in your own life if you start backsliding and say, you know what? I feel like I'm so far from God, I can barely hear his voice, but I know that he can and he will finish what he starts. Amen? Amen. 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 Some of you hang in there with me. I'm losing a few people, but I want you to finish. I'm almost done. It says this. This is what we have to look forward to. Why does that matter? Well, I'll tell you why it matters. Because I've had some bad days, like I said, in 35 plus years with Jesus. I mean some really bad days. I'm talking days where it made sense to me why people would consider things like suicide. You might be like, how dare you speak like that, Pastor? You're a man of God. Don't ever speak like that. Well, you know, I'm a human being just like you. And I've had some days so dark, so bad, I just thought, what? Why bother? Now, I wasn't maybe going to kill myself, but I was thinking, Jesus, if you took me to heaven right now, I would not complain. You know, if I get run over by a truck on my way back from this errand I'm running, that wouldn't be the worst thing that's ever happened. But then I think about my wife and others, and I'm thinking, that's pretty selfish. But for me personally, I'm thinking, man, I'm, I'm cool with that. This is awful. You start thinking about that stuff. Well, this is what you have to look forward to. It only gets better from here. This is the closest thing to hell you're going to experience now if you're a believer. 
And that starts to matter when you get to my place in life. I'm going to go back to that definition I started with at the beginning, but now I'm going to combine sanctification and salvation that are used synonymously throughout the whole theological dissertations of people like Paul and so on. It says justification, as it said earlier, is a once-for-all positional holiness in Christ, while maturity is a practical, progressive holiness. Glorification, say glorification. That is the third and final part, is a permanent ultimate holiness these three phases separate believers from the penalty of sin when you were justified the power that sin still wants to pretend it has over your lives but should not as you're being uh, sanctified and then finally the presence of sin we won't have any when we're glorified amen, amen. you'll have a body that won't die and break down You'll be in the presence of God, not sometimes, and you won't be in the presence of God just by faith. You'll be in the literal presence of God. Wow. That's why I say in the end, God's plan of salvation and sanctification for us is an ongoing, comprehensive, and, oh, I love this, guaranteed. Say guaranteed. guaranteed. Yeah. If you're like me, you've tried to cash in on a guarantee, like the 30-back day guarantee, you know. And then they give you all the reasons why you voided the contract and you don't actually get a guarantee and you're still going to have to pay for it and whatever. And you're like, ah, you know, and you're getting, you know, non-Christian with the customer service agent and the old you is rising up and all that kind of stuff, you know. Now, this is not one of those tricks. This is guaranteed. Amen? Amen. Plan of total victory. Let's close in prayer. I'm going to ask my wife to come up and give us some announcements as we close. Thank you, AJ, the amazing. Father, I thank you so much for your plan of salvation and sanctification. Through you, in the work you did on the cross 2,000 years ago, the work you're still doing all over the world in every one of our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit, and the work that you will do when we all rise to meet you in the air and are taken to glory with you. God, you have the most amazing and brilliant and beautiful plan of salvation and sanctification for us. I pray that not one of us will ever cave into sin again and just say, well, it was inevitable. I had no power over it because that just isn't true. Lord, but when we do fall, not if, but when we do fall, let us be reminded that a righteous man gets up again and again, seven times even, and keeps moving forward. Let us not sit in neutral. In your mighty name, Jesus, you deserve more. Amen and amen. Praise God. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from All People Christian Church. For more information about our church or for more sermons like these, Please check us out on the web at allpeoplecc.com.